When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown, but whoever has been forgiven little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, Your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. This reading is from Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 9. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. It is a joy and a privilege to see these guys at student ministry each week and to see them grow in their faith. And it really is a privilege to walk with these young people. And today we also have the privilege of confirming them. And uh, the, I want to introduce you to the whole uh, confirmation class for this year. And they are Phoebe Holmes, Hunter Eno, and Hayden Tiki, and Christian Noble. And what a privilege it is to see these young people step out in faith and say yes to a life of following Jesus today, to be able to affirm the baptism that their parent and the promises that their parents made when they were baptized. And uh, it is so much fun to see them grow. And today I would love if we would all just pray together over them as we remember each one by name and just pray God's blessings over them today on their confirmation. Will you pray with me? God, we thank you for Hunter and Christian and Hayden and Phoebe. God, we ask that you would continue to grow them in their walk with you. We thank you that they have made this profession of faith, that they have chosen to follow you and to own that. God, we pray that as a church family, we would be there to walk alongside and support them and encourage them and to be there for them when life is hard and when life is filled with joy and everything in between. God, we thank you for this opportunity to be a part of their confirmation. We pray over their families as they love and support them. We ask all these things in your name. Amen. Thank you for praying with me over the confirmands today. Now we uh, get to turn to God's word. We're going to be in Luke 7 today. So if you're not there already, I invite you to turn there. And as you're doing that, I just want to talk a little bit about a time when I found myself in a very awkward situation. And maybe you have found yourself in a similar kind of situation. Grad parties are a big deal, right? And I was invited to a grad party for one of the students I was working with when I was living in Indiana. And they often had grad parties at the fairgrounds. And it reminded me a lot of the Sherburne County Fairgrounds. Uh, drove up to the Boone County Fairgrounds and there are all these small buildings where they hold social events. And I see all of these grad signs. So I just follow them and can imagine what happens next. I walk in and I look around and I start wandering around the tables where all the picture boards are and there's all this memorabilia out. 
And I start looking at the pictures and I don't recognize anyone in them. And I start looking around the room and I don't recognize anyone in the room, which is also unusual because it was a pretty small town. And I have found myself uninvited to a grad party. I went to the wrong one. Thankfully, I figured this out before I had gotten a plate of food and sat down at a table. And so I just sort of quickly, but very casually just made my way out of that building. And I just felt so embarrassed. Like, I hope no one noticed me who does know me and is going to start calling me like the grad party crasher or something. Maybe you have been in a situation where you have shown up somewhere and you know that you are uninvited or you just look around and you're like, I do not fit here. I do not belong. When have you had that feeling of of being out of place? Like you kind of stick out like a sore thumb. Maybe you've showed up for class and discovered like I once did that you were at the wrong hour. Or maybe you've showed up at the gym and looked around the weight room thinking, what am I even doing here? Do I even fit? I also feel this way when I show up and I'm either underdressed or overdressed for a particular occasion or just wearing the wrong thing. Like when I showed up at the seventh grade Elk River baseball game and I was wearing the color of the opposing team. Don't worry, I am now the proud owner of an Elk River shirt. This can, and I imagine has happened to all of us at least once in our lives. We find ourselves in a place where we feel uninvited or we actually are uninvited and we don't feel like we belong maybe because we're in our room and we look around and we're like, I am not wealthy enough. I am not educated enough. I am not right wing or left wing enough or even spiritual enough. And this can happen when we walk into churches too, can it? I've walked into churches where I have felt uninvited simply because I didn't look like I fit or I was just new and I just felt like I was sticking out of the crowd. Maybe you're like, really? Someone who works at church wouldn't feel welcome in one, but it's true. And maybe you can relate to an experience like that. Sometimes we disqualify ourselves before we are even in the room when it comes to feeling spiritual enough because of our past mistakes, or our lack of knowledge, or our insecurity around knowing scripture or praying out loud. In our scripture reading today, we meet a woman who shows up uninvited to a dinner party, but against all social norms, found herself in a place where she couldn't belong more. There's a man named Simon, he's hosting the dinner, and he had invited a man named Jesus to be the guest of honor that night. Now, these dinners were fairly common. They're often held out in these courtyard areas so that the people in town could see and hear what was going on. But if anyone from the town wanted to listen in, they would come in to the gate, and at some point the gate would be closed, and they could sit around the edges quietly. And these people were all men. Now, Simon the host was also a Pharisee. And that means he was part of a group of people who were known for being religious leaders in the community. Pharisees saw God's law as being at the heart of their faith. It was about doing the right things, following the right rules. And they not only followed God's written law, but they also had something called the oral law, which was this set of interpretations that they had in order to follow the written law in places where it didn't seem clear. And in their attempts to be faithful to the law, they often lost sight of the spirit of the law. Now, this doesn't seem like that big of a deal, but underlying their devotion to the law was hypocrisy and self-righteousness. And Jesus often called them out on it. It's like they were the Bible students of the day who made grades and not godliness the goal of their life. So while we learn in the first verse that Simon invited Jesus, it was not a warm welcome. And yet Jesus did not turn down the invitation to come to the table. They're all reclining at the table. You can picture this with me. They're leaning on their left arms and eating with their right as was customary. And they're probably making some small talk about the day. And all of a sudden a woman shows up. And there is no indication that Simon had invited this woman. And in fact, it is just the opposite. 
it is very clear from the description that this woman is not invited. If you look at Luke 7, it says, A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at a Pharisee's house. So she came there. Who was this woman? What kind of sinful life was she living? Could she be a prostitute? How did she find out that Jesus was there? And why was she so compelled to go see him? We don't have any specific information about her other than what this story tells us. She comes with this small jar of perfume, which was likely very costly. And because Jesus is reclined at the table, she comes behind him and she goes down to his feet and overcome with emotion, she just begins weeping. Now, mind you, this is in the middle of a dinner party. And this woman interrupts, comes in at the guest of honor's feet and begins crying and her tears quickly covered his dirt covered feet. Because even in the city at this time, this, the roads would have been dirt and they're wearing sandals and everything got kind of grimy, but she doesn't care. She takes down her hair and she starts wiping his feet with it and she kissed them and poured her expensive perfume on them. And the courtyard became saturated with the sweet smelling scent of these spices, the aroma of the perfume, and also with the uncomfortable awkwardness of what had just happened. The people around the table begin to shift in their chairs and murmur to each other. And Simon, the host, mutters under his breath, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. And suddenly, it's silent around the table. Jesus looks at Simon and says, Simon, I have something to tell you. And Jesus didn't snap at Simon and tell him off, but he tells a story. And the story today might go like this. Two people owed money to the bank. One person owed two months worth of pay. And the other one owed a year and a half worth of pay. Neither person has money to pay. So the bank issues forgiveness for both debts. Now, which person will be more grateful to the bank? It almost seems like a rhetorical question, doesn't it? Like, Jesus, do you really want me to answer that? But Simon responds correctly with the one who owed more money. Jesus acknowledges that he has judged correctly and changes his focus. And he turns to the woman and asks Simon a powerful question. Do you see this woman? Do you see her? This isn't just a matter of Simon seeing her with his eyes. Of course he saw her. Everybody saw her. She just interrupted the whole party. She just says, do you see this woman with your heart? Is really what he's asking. He goes on to say that, well, Simon, you invited me to this party. You didn't show me any of the common welcoming rituals. Today, when we get together with someone for dinner, we probably would offer to take their jacket, show them where to sit, ask them what they want to drink, etc. In Jesus' day, this meant a kiss of greeting. A servant would wash the dirt off their feet, or they would at least be offered a bowl of water to wash with, and they would be anointed with oil. And Simon did none of these things, and it is highly unlikely that he forgot in choosing not to do these things, it was an invitation of social shame. And in contrast, the woman who was uninvited showed extravagant love by boldly coming right to the feet of Jesus. At the risk of social shame at the other end of the spectrum, she wet his feet, kissing them. It was intimacy that was shunned in this culture. And to undo her hair would have been culturally shocking. And she anointed him with the perfume that could have been used to seduce men in town. What did she think would happen next? What was supposed to happen next? Would Jesus look at the woman and expose the scandal? No. Instead, he extends forgiveness. He looks at her and he says a few simple words. Your sins are forgiven. 
the people at the table thought this might be the biggest scandal of the night. After all, only God could forgive sins, and if this man was claiming to be God, he was the real sinner in the room. But in this moment, it's as if Jesus and the woman are the only ones in the room. And he looks at her and he says, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Wow. Can you imagine what this woman must have experienced when she heard these words? The woman who walked around town knowing that she had a label on her? Sinner? Jesus had just covered that label with the word forgiven. And her life would never be the same. She simply showed up where Jesus was and boldly, unashamedly walked into a room where she did not belong and found the one place where she would always belong, at the feet of Jesus. It is not hard to believe that this woman may have already met Jesus once before. Maybe they were passing on the street. Perhaps he had touched her or healed her or simply just spoken to her about his love for her. Because her love and humility in showing up and anointing Jesus showed her deep love and gratitude in response to how she had experienced him, not as a judgmental, righteous leader, but one who saw her. One who saw past her flaws and mistakes, saw past her sinful lifestyle, and saw her for who she really is, a daughter of the king. And just as Jesus saw the woman for who she really was, in the story we see Jesus for who he really is. Not simply a prophet, a religious leader of the day like Simon would have thought, but we see Jesus We see him as a God who is personally and actively involved in the lives of his people. In this story, we see a God who invites sinners. Jesus' invitation to the woman stands in such contrast to Simon's invitation. He let her approach him with boldness. And I can't help but think of the verse in Hebrews 4.16 that says, Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. This is the invitation of Jesus over and over in the Bible. We have all messed up. We have all sinned. None of us belong at Jesus' feet. We all wear the label sinner, but he invites all of us. I think it's important to note that Jesus' invitation was for both Simon and for the woman, The difference is that one gets it and the other one doesn't. The invitation is always there for the one who recognizes their need for forgiveness. No matter what is in our past, Jesus can always cover the labels we've been given with one word, forgiven. And this forgiveness is not earned by doing all the things. Instead, it's only because of Jesus' death on the cross that we have access to the forgiveness of God. So you also see a God who initiates faith. When Jesus looks at the woman and says, your faith has saved you, he uses a word that our confirmation students have been talking about. It's the word pistuo in Greek. That means to trust in, rely on, or adhere to. It's the same word that's used in the passage from Ephesians that Hunter read for us today. For by grace you have been saved through faith, through pistuos, And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. We might be tempted to think that the woman has earned faith somehow because of what she did in the story, but all she really did was put her trust in Jesus. She responded to what Jesus had already done in her life. Faith is not something we initiate, it's something that God does in us through his Holy Spirit. Our staff is reading a book together right now called Life in the Presence of God, and it's by Kenneth Boa. He says this, Trusting in Jesus is a prerequisite to experiencing the presence of God. And when we repent of our sins and place our trust in him for salvation, we receive his spirit. Without the spirit, we can never live like Jesus, but with him we can. Martin Luther established five alone statements of the Reformation that all come from scripture. And one of them is faith alone or sola fide. 
And it just means that our salvation, this idea that we can spend life in the presence of Jesus today and forever, is not based on what we do, but what Jesus has done through his death on the cross. Sometimes we can even confuse faith milestones like confirmation with being that work that we need to do to belong to Jesus. Like if we check all the boxes, we will earn our way to heaven. But confirmation is not a graduation from faith. It's not a graduation party. In confirmation, what the students are saying is that they want to pistuo or follow or trust in Jesus who first loved them and first forgave them. And it's not just about getting to heaven, but it's about following Jesus today and forever. Finally, we see a God who instills peace. Jesus' last words to the woman, maybe ever in person, we really don't know, are this. Go in peace. The story could have gone so differently. The woman could have walked away in shame and disgrace, but she didn't. She walked out in peace, the kind of peace that is true and lasting, not temporary or fleeting. Jesus invites sinners. He initiates faith and he instills peace. If faith were merely an intellectual exercise, a leap in the dark, or even wishful thinking, there would be no lasting peace. It's the kind of peace that the people in Jesus' story knew when their debts had been forgiven. They weren't lying awake at night thinking about how to repay the moneylender. It's the kind of peace that helps each of us sleep at night, that allows us to rest in God when the world around us is divided and uncertain. When I was little, I remember that when we would have a babysitter, I never wanted to go to sleep until my mom or dad came home. The kind of peace that God offers is the peace that a child has when they know that an adult who loves them is just in the other room. Because of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, we are invited to life of peace in his presence today and every day. So to close, I just want to leave you with a few questions to think about. The first is this, like the woman in their story and the confirmation students today, have you responded to the invitation of Jesus to trust him completely? And if not, what is holding you back? What is keeping you from boldly coming to Jesus? Second question is this, like Simon the Pharisee, who have you labeled as sinner? Who wears that sticker? How might you need to examine your own heart and receive the forgiveness that Jesus offers and extend that to another? The third one is this. Will you say yes each day to the invitations of Jesus? To love like he loved, to spend time in his word, to talk to him as you go about your day. What is it this week that Jesus is inviting you to? Because faith is a process, it's a journey, it's not a one-time event or moment, but it is a daily trust to pistuo, to follow Jesus. And today we have the privilege of taking communion together and we get to remember today that Jesus invites each one of us to the table, to a place where we belong without shame or regret. We all wear the label of sinner, but by God's grace and his death on the cross, when we place our trust in him, we find our new identity as people who are forgiven. And as we share in this meal together, we have an opportunity to remember the God who invites sinners, who initiates faith, and who instills peace in our lives. Jesus was at the Passover meal with his disciples reclining at the table, much like he had done in the courtyard that night at Simon's house. And we read scripture, and we read that it tells us that Jesus took some bread, and he gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it into pieces, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Same way after supper, he took the cup of wine and he said, this cup is the new covenant 
between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. Will you pray with me? God, thank you for the sacrifice of your son and the offer of new life that we have in him. God, we pray that as we take this bread and drink this cup, that we would be reminded of your love, grace, and forgiveness today that you so freely offer us. We pray all of this in your name. Amen. Now let's eat and drink as we remember while we listen to this closing song. And then we'll be back to pray and close out our time together. <laughs>